don't sound very enthusiastic, but okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, last time we talked a little bit about curved black holes. Um, I gave you the metric in excruciating detail in three uh, different coordinate systems, and we talked about some properties, the metric in particular, the ergosphere and the horizon. And then we talked about geodesics, like throwing a little grad student into the black hole and just trying to measure uh, his or her motion. Um, and I had gave, given you uh, homework. <laughs> How many of you did your homework? Mm, okay. <laughs> so the homework was to show that, um, so you know, you have some geodesic equations here for, uh, so homework, <laughs> solution. <laughs> uh, so we had something like dz, or well, I'll just write it, dx d tau square plus gamma mu, say alpha beta, u alpha u beta was equal to zero. And I was saying that this is um, not great because it's a second order system of differential equations and we would like to like rewrite that as a system of first order equations so do a first order reduction. Um, and one way to do that is to realize that the energy which is defined as uh, T alpha U alpha, the angular momentum, I guess I put tildes on this last time, which is phi alpha U alpha, Carter constant Q, which is essentially the killing tensor K alpha beta, U alpha U beta, uh, are conserved um, in the sense that these are constants of the motion so d by d tau uh, of E is zero, d by d tau of L is zero, d by d tau of Q is zero. And in addition to that, you have the normalization condition for time like geodesics that u alpha, u alpha is minus one. So um, the goal was to use these expressions to find a geodesic equation that looks like t dot equals something, r dot equals something, theta dot equals something, and phi dot equals something. So, so the way to actually solve this is to you know, just write it out, right? So you have that u alpha is some vector. I'm gonna call it t dot, r dot, theta dot, phi dot, where the dot means uh, derivatives with respect to proper time. And so then e dot, e tilde, for example, or minus e tilde is going to be, you know, the metric alpha beta uh, t alpha u beta, and that is going to be g t t t dot plus g t phi phi dot. Okay. And similarly with l, right? So if you go and you calculate l, you'll have a similar expression for Q, you'll have a similar expression. And here you'll have minus one is equal to a similar expression with uh, T dot squares and phi dot squares and R dot squares and all of that. Um, so then all you do is you have four equations for in principle four unknowns, T dot, phi dot, R dot, and theta dot, and you just algebraically solve that. And ta-da, it's not that hard, right? Um, you can find these expressions in just standard textbooks. I'm not going to write them again, but as a corollary of this extra credit, I guess I called it, homework was to show that these things are conserved. So let's see, let's write over here. So the idea was that d by d tau acting on E, say, I want to show that this is equal to zero, question mark. So I can rewrite d by d tau on E as, um, the four velocity u alpha times the gradient, the covariant derivative acting on, uh, on E, but E was T alpha, I put a minus sign here, so it's T alpha um, u alpha. What? I have too many alphas. Ah! So when I teach this in class, like I just annoy my students whenever they say something like that, I just put like a little tiny dot here. No, it's a different variable. Okay. So let's call it beta beta. Um, so you just use a chain rule here and you get u alpha u beta d alpha t beta 
plus u alpha, well, the t beta here, u alpha, d alpha, u beta. And then you recognize that u alpha, d alpha, u beta is the geodesic equation, so this vanishes. And then you recognize that here you have the covariant derivative of a killing vector, uh, contracted, doubly contracted with uh, two copies of the four velocity. This um, two copies of the four velocities is a, symmet a symmetric matrix, which means I can I get the same thing if I symmetrize on those two indices. By the contraction, I can then just symmetrize on these two indices. But uh, the killing equation, remember, is that this vanishes, which then means that this has to be zero. Thus, this is zero. Thus. Uh, and the same goes through if you calculate it for Q. Um, and obviously, the, the norm of the four velocity is also conserved. Okay? So those are some of the tricks that you sort of employ when you're dealing with geodesics. So now, we've all warmed up for like the type of math we're going to be, yes. Can you repeat that question? Because I have to repeat it to the thing, and I couldn't hear you. Yes, so the question is, can you always show that the equations are separable in this sense of separability if your background is uh, stationary and axisymmetric? And the answer is that that's not always uh, the case. So for example, in um, there's modified theories of gravity where the curve metric is not a solution to your field equations. And in that case, um, the space and is still stationary and axisymmetric in the sense that there is a conserved energy and there's a conserved angular momentum, and the normal of the four velocity is still the normal of the four velocity, but you can show that there's no second run killing tensor. So without the presence of this Q, you, you can't even start following this, this proof. So the, the issue of separability of the equations of motion is very tightly related to the Petrop type of your space time. Um, and you know, proving that your space time is petrop type uh, goes beyond just saying that it's uh, stationary and axisymmetric. Uh, and it depends on the theory and the field equations. Uh, so talk to me about it later if you want, because that's like a full lecture. Um, okay, good. So now that we've warmed up, <laughs> let's, um, let's look at Emrys, okay? So an Emry is defined as a definition I'm going to do it the math way. Uh, it's a stellar mass compact object. So stellar mass compact object in my life is abbreviated as SCO, because <laughs> I don't want to write that a million times. Uh, in a generic, generic, um, I'm going to say in spiral or orbit, orbit around a supermassive black hole. So there are two acronyms for you, stellar compact object or stellar mass compact object and supermassive black hole. Okay, so that's our little definition. Um, and so even though a lot of what I do has to do with calculating these orbits um, and calculating the gravitational waves emitted by, by such systems, I think it's always important to remember like what sort of astrophysical scenarios could produce these binaries. So we're going to do like two minutes of astronomy. Uh, so just bear with me. <laughs> um, so there's two, so formation scenarios. There's two classic formation scenarios that you should know of. Um, and these are sort of fairly lengthy topics. So uh, we're going to do it fairly briefly here. So the the first scenario is called the capture scenario, right? 
And here's the idea that you know you have a galaxy. We're gonna we're gonna do formation scenarios with pictures only, okay? So, and I got me my colors over here. So galaxies are orange. Everyone knows that. Um, so here's my galaxy, and everyone knows that supermassive black holes are blue. So here's my supermassive black hole, very much not to scale. Uh, but I was told that if I don't draw big, you can't see it. Um, so let's imagine that you have some sort of binary that's over here, and it's going around like this. So imagine like it's going around like that, okay? Some binary of, of two compact objects that are both like small, like stellar mass black holes maybe, something like that. But as you can imagine, galaxies have tons of stars and there's tons of uh, processes that occur in the, in, in the galaxy that can affect um, the dynamics of my little two stars. See, unfortunately, we like to solve the two-body problem, but in real life, there are more than two bodies. Um, and so, and there's also more than three bodies. There's like a gazillion bodies. And so every now and then, it can occur that this binary will interact with a third object. The third in this chord is going to be painted purple. So here is uh, the bad guy. And the bad guy interacts with this binary. And the end product of that interaction can be that the disturber here becomes bound to one of the components of my good binary, and now these two go around, and the other component of the binary is sort of ejected, okay? And there is a probability that that ejected component will be headed toward a galactic center, and if that's the case, eventually it will get close enough to the supermassive black hole that it will sort of like loop around and this distance may still be very, very large, right? So this is not a small distance, but what happens is that in the process of coming with a small impact parameter to the supermassive black hole, this small object emits gravitational waves, which everyone knows are white, okay? And when that happens, the binary formed by the small compact object and the Emry, which where the, the, this binary in the orbit was very, very large, the seven major axis is very, very large, becomes much more bound because now that orbit has lost a lot, of, a lot of energy in this like burst of radiation that it emitted. So what happens now is that instead of this one going back to its initial trajectory that's over here, it becomes bound, bound to the supermassive black hole. Okay? And you might think like this is incredibly unlikely, but it turns out that if you take a probability that's really, really tiny and you multiply it by a gazillion, which is the technical word for the number of stars in a galaxy, then you get a number that's finite. Okay, and the particular value of what that number is, like how many events like this happen inside of some uh, volume centered at the solar system per year, nobody knows. Uh, there's very complicated astrophysical processes, and there's rates. So there's the rate of how often this would happen, and the, the, they range from zero times per year to like a thousand times per year for systems that would be detectable with gravitational wave instruments in a decade. How are we going to be able to figure it out? Well, either someone really, really, really smart is gonna put in all of the physics that are needed to solve this problem, maybe on supercomputers, and calculate it, and convince us this is the right number, or much more likely, we'll turn the instrument on and we'll measure. <laughs> and we'll say like, ah, the answer was 11. Okay, so that's one formation scenario. Another formation scenario is, what did I call this one? Uh, disk, former, disk formation. This one is less likely than, than that one, but let's describe it anyways. Okay, so in the idea of disk formation, what you have, you have your supermassive black hole, which again is blue. Uh, 
Um, and, you know, a lot of galaxies um, that host supermassive black holes tend to have accretion disks around them. Those accretion disks need not always be perfectly thin disks like we like to imagine, but a good chunk of the time they are, or they're expected to be. So let me draw a disk. And so imagine that here's the black hole. I'm gonna look at the black hole like from bird's eye view, like from the top. So here's, here's the disk. And imagine that the disk is, is, is thin, it's like a thin disk. Um, and there's a lot of gas here, and maybe, maybe the disk stops some distance away from the horizon. Um, that distance might be the innermost stable circular orbit. It may be a little bit closer in. Doesn't really matter. Point is that this uh, disk has an enormous amount of mass, but in any particular region of the disk, there's very little density. It's because the disk is gigantic. Okay, so it's very, very small density, but then you integrate over a large volume, you get a large mass. And what can happen is that in the outskirts here of the disk, the gas that is present can, can fragment and form stars. Just like stars are supposed to form, uh, say, in the solar system, right? You have a giant molecular cloud and it's sort of collapsed and then fragmented, um, produce a little star. So this star, this sun-like object, but more massive maybe than the sun-like object, it's gonna be moving around here, it's gonna take forever. Eventually, uh, uh, it's gonna migrate also, it's gonna migrate, when we say migrate, we mean it's gonna move in closer to the black hole, slowly, very, very slowly, because it's very far away, uh, not due to the emission of gravitational waves. It has nothing to do with gravitational waves. It migrates in because uh, it's immersed in a disk, and as it's moving around, um, there's viscous drag because of interactions with the material, but also the object produces like little ripples, little waves on the disk, and those little waves on the disk carry away angular momentum, which then back react on the orbit by like pushing it in a little bit. Eventually, if you wait like a long, long, long time, this star can go supernova. Supernova is red. Kapoof. Okay? And if the original object was massive enough after it goes supernova, it can leave behind a black hole. So after this explosion, now we have a little black hole. Now, you're gonna ask, oh, but the thing went supernova, so it blew up the disk. The answer is no, it didn't blow up the disk because that's, there's not enough energy to blow up um, the entire disk and disrupt the disk. You might disrupt a little bit of the neighborhood of this disk, but this will refill very, very fast. So if you wait a little bit longer, it's like nothing happened, but now you have a black hole. And this black hole, guess what? What's gonna do what black holes do, which is just go around. And eventually, just like the star was being dragged into the, into the supermassive black hole, this object will slowly move closer and closer in until eventually it enters the gravitational wave dominated regime. And now you have an embryo. Okay. Okay, so I don't work on formation scenarios because I'm not an astrophysicist, so please don't ask me questions. But, uh, <laughs> but I think it's important for all of us to know what are the formation scenarios that people have in mind are for the models that we are trying to solve for. Like, so that we know that these actually are supposed to happen in nature, how they're supposed to happen in nature. Um, and if you want to read more about this, there's thesi after thesi that have been written about it. Yep. I no! I said no questions. It's important that the small object is still calm. It cannot be just a star. So why is the case? Yeah, yeah, very good. So. Uh, so the question Paulo asks is, it is important that the object uh, be compact, that is, it did not be a star for the definition of an embryo. Why is that? That's a, it's a, good, good, it's a very good question. So here we're dealing with supermassive black holes. So certainly, if the supermassive black hole has its masses like 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, the, um, the tidal force that it exerts on a companion, say when the companion is at the horizon or close to the horizon, is actually very small. Why is that? Because the tidal force goes as the Riemann tensor, and the Riemann tensor goes as the mass of the object divided by the separation, say, cubed. 
Okay, so if your separation is roughly the horizon, so m, then m over m cube is one over m square. And if m is giant, then that, that, that force is very weak. So you can certainly have a star go right through the horizon and don't even notice that there was a horizon there. I mean, there, there will be tidal deformations a little bit, but, but it, won't, it won't get disrupted. So in principle, you can have an object like a neutron star or like a regular star falling into, into this black hole. The reason that we don't consider that is because the strength of the gravitational waves that they will emit is much, much smaller than the strength of the gravitational waves emitted by a small black hole going into, into a supermassive black hole. Because the gravitational wave strength scales, if you, if you want, it scales with the mass of the objects, but when they're black holes, <laughs> but when they're stars, they scale essentially with the density of the object. So, okay. All right, so with that short explanation in mind, let's now talk a little bit about modeling. So, modeling. So I like to describe this modeling of, oh, so what are we modeling? We're modeling the gravitational waves emitted by, by this MRIS, okay? And so to understand the gravitational waves, you need to understand the motion. Unfortunately, the problems are coupled, so we need to understand the motion and the gravitational waves like at the same time. Um, so, so the way I like to describe this is through this very nice diagram that I first saw write down, uh, written down by uh, Lior Barak. So Barak has a very nice um, review article that you can all read. So Barak is a professor in Southampton, Lior Barak. And I think it's CQG 2609. There's others, Eric Poisson, the same Poisson that wrote the Poisson Toolkit book and the Poisson and Will book, et al. He has a living reviews in relativity, LRR 14 from 2011 also. So these are your references uh, if you want to read more about it. But in any case, let me plot, how do I want to plot this? Okay. Let me plot on, on this axis the orbital separation, R, divided by the, say, total mass of the system or the mass of the supermassive black hole. Let me plot here the mass ratio. So the mass of the small compact object divided by the mass of the big object. Or the total mass, it doesn't matter. And so the mass ratio goes, ranges from zero to one. That's the domain. And the separation, ranges from when the thing merges, so maybe not zero, but <laughs> whatever you want to call it, the horizon. I'm going to call it zero. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. To all the way to spatial infinity, right? And so in this domain, what I want to understand is what approximations can I use to solve for the trajectories and the gravitational waves? Or what methods can I use? So you see, if the mass ratio is very close to one, well, the first thing I'm going to say is like, I know, this is all nonsense. Just throw it all into a supercomputer, let the computer deal with it, and we don't have to worry about it. Um, the problem is that if you have one of these extreme mass uh, ratio orbits, the amount of time it takes for the orbit to adiabatically shrink by a little bit scales inversely with the mass ratio. Okay, so if your mass ratio is very, very tiny, you have to wait a very, very long time for the gravitational waves to back react on the orbit and for the orbit to shrink and for the system to merge. On top of that, if you have an extreme mass ratio in spiral, you have to model in your numerical grid not just the supermassive black hole, which is actually pretty large, but also the small compact object. So you have to resolve the compact object, which again, that resolution, that difference in scales is again of order the mass ratio. And on top of that, you have to then also model the gravitational waves that typically have a wavelength that is much larger than, than the size of the small compact object. And, and, and that needs to be extracted very far away from the binary system. So all of that means that if you actually try to push your numerical simulations to the Embry regime, which is over here, you are just out of luck. 
okay? So there's some sort of limit as to how well numerical relativity, uh, not how well, but some limit of, of what numerical relativity can do today, okay? Some, some bar here. On top of that, if you, even if you're considering comparable mass binaries, so like two black holes equal mass, if you put them really, really far away from each other, then the amount of time they're gonna take to spiral in is gonna be enormous. And you know, you only have as much time to run your codes as the lifetime of a grad student thesis. So that puts a bound on the maximum separation, which means you cannot really go all the way to spatial infinity because then your grad students don't graduate. Okay, so then that defines some sort of regime here where NR works wonders if you actually work on it very carefully. And this goes back to Peter's talk where, you know, in order to do the numerical relativity problem, you have to take your space time and foliate it with a space like hypersurfaces and do a three plus one decomposition and then ensure that your constraints are satisfied, blah, blah. It's all very complicated. It's all very cool. It's all stuff I'm not going to talk about. Then what else can you do? Ah, so Peter talked about the post-Newtonian approximation, right? Uh, he was actually talking about the post-Minkowskian approximation. It's an expansion in M over R or in weak fields. If you want in capital G, the strength or the coupling constant or the gravitational interaction being very weak. But on top of that, you can also use uh, an expansion in small velocities. That expansion of the small velocities uh, also sometimes called the post-Newtonian approximation. I'm gonna talk about that tomorrow. On my birthday, I might add. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, that's okay, because that's like what I actually do, so it'll be easy. <laughs> um, but of course, you know, as the orbital separations become very, very small, the strength of the gravitational interaction becomes huge, and the orbital velocities can become actually not much, much smaller than the speed of light. So clearly, these post-Newtonian approximations cannot work when the orbital separation or the velocities, when the orbital separations are small or the velocities are large. So there must be some different color. Pian is blue. Um, there is some minimum regime here, some line below which I cannot go with my post-Newtonian approximation. So, so, but I can go all the way here. So you would think that I can extend this all the way to like tiny mass ratios. Okay, that the post approximation, expansion in velocity will work even when you have a tiny, tiny object going around a supermassive black hole, as long as the separation is large, okay? It turns out Nobody fully understands this, so math people, you're welcome to like, work on this if you want, that the properties of the post-Newtonian expansion that has actually been taken to um, what we would call in physics uh, three-loop order, so that's an expansion in, that has been taken up to V over C to the seventh power relative to whatever the leading order term was in the expression that you're trying to calculate. Okay, there's a very high order perturbative expansion. So you can look at the convergence properties of this series. And you can, under, you can try to study, well, you can try to understand whether that series converges to something as you add more and more terms, or whether that series is asymptotic or you know, divergent. <coughs> And we don't, have, we don't know, we don't know for sure whether series is asymptotic or not. Um, what you do know is that as you look at more and more extreme mass ratios, the coefficients in the series become larger and larger. Which is suggestive that an approximation that might have been okay over here, if you fix the order to like V over C to the seventh, might not be as accurate if you reduce the mass, if you increase the mass ratio, if you make it more extreme. So it turns out that for the purposes of, um, of, of observation and for modeling, the post-engineering approximation is not really valid or accurate uh, enough as the mass ratio goes to zero. Okay, great, so boo, Pian. 
So what can we do now? Well, anyone want to guess what's the obvious perturbative scheme that we can use? I love it when audiences are very participative. Argentinian guy, what are you going to do? Hmm, very good. I was not going to talk about that, but no problem. So yes, these are essentially Taylor expansions in V over C, okay? So you might ask, well, we know what to do to improve the convergence uh, properties of a series, we resum it, okay? So there's ways in which you can resum these expansions, and one way that's very, very clever and very effective is the so-called effective one-body approach. You can think of it as a resummation. That tries to make post-Newtonian, which I forgot to label, more and more accurate, if you want more and more valid, uh, in this regime and actually in this regime too. Like it wants to push this line to the left and this line down, okay? But no, what I meant is what do we do here? How do we solve the problem here? Well, student. Yeah, we do black hole perturbation theory, right? We expand our problem in Q much less than one, okay? And that's a good parameter to expand because unlike the velocity which changes as your orbit evolves, Q doesn't change because, well, it, it changes because it, the objects could accrete a little bit of mass energy. But you know, for the most part, the mass is essentially constant, so Q is essentially constant. It's a good expansion parameter. So here's where um, cell force calculations or black hole perturbation theory calculations are, are done. Now, do not go and tell your friends, oh, Nico told me that these are the lines, and I can sort of infer that this is zero and this is one, this is like 0.25 and this must be 0.6. Like clearly where I drew this line, it's a cartoon, right? Like nobody knows where these lines are, like at all. <laughs> so it is entirely possible, but we, we do know that post-Newtonian seems to agree with numerical relativity in this, in this regime from the comparisons that have been done, especially when you resum them. We also do know that self-force calculations seem to work or seem to reduce to the post-Newtonian results if I take the self-force calculations that are just solutions in Q much less than one, and then on top of that, I do a post-Newtonian expansion, a V over C much less than one expansion. Then if I do those two expansions here, and then I take my post-Newtonian one and I do an expansion in Q much less than one, then those two bivariate expansions match. So that's good. And there have been comparisons between self-force calculations and numerical relativity simulations in some regimes, but it's not, it's not clear how, how well those two match because NR can't really go here. So. Okay. No, le lecturers are not allowed to ask questions. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> yes, correct. Excellent, so let's, let's explore that idea because that's exactly what we're gonna do. <laughs> Thank you, it's like I planted that question. Um, okay, so there, historically there have been many, many ways in which you could try to model Embrys using a Q much less than one expansion. I am going to explain this or present just a few of the methods. I, there is no time to present all of the methods. All of the methods are approximate in one way or another. Some are way better than others at, in terms of like accuracy of your approximation. So let me first show you the methods that are least accurate but easiest to understand. And hopefully, before I'm done, I'm gonna be able to derive some of the equations that are used in cell force analysis, okay? So, so now I need to cheat because otherwise I'm gonna get the equations wrong. Um, so let me begin with the cludgiest of the cludgiest approximations. 
sometimes called the semi-relativistic approximation. I felt like I had to describe this because it was pioneered, well, because I'm in Italy, and it was pioneered by Remo Ruffini, so I figured if I don't mention Ruffini at least once, then people are going to get mad at me. <laughs> Bigger font, yes. Ru, okay. Ruffini and Sasaki. And they have a very, very beautiful paper in PTP, Progress in Theoretical Physics. It is a Japanese journal, 66, from 1981, that you can refer to. It's very readable. So what they said is, you know, like, like Peter was saying, like, you know, if Q is zero, at that point, everything is just a geodesic, right? So I can certainly take my metric to be the metric of my supermassive black hole plus a perturbation um, that's going to represent gravitational waves, just the gravitational waves on top of the supermassive black hole spacetime, which are produced by the small compact object going around. And so the four velocity of the small compact object is going to be represented by uh, the background solution, which is the four velocity of geodesic motion plus a small correction to the trajectory. And in principle, you could go to higher and higher order here. Okay? So the equations that you need to solve, remind you, are... I guess I'll write them over here because they're always going to be the ones we are going to solve. G mu nu is equal to 8 pi t mu nu. G and Z are 1. And obviously, conservation of stress energy tensor. Okay? So, in the words of Wheeler, I suppose, um, at least as far as I know, matter is telling curvature. Uh, or space-time how to curve, and then the curvature of space-time is telling matter how to move, but these equations are obviously coupled, so you need to solve them sort of simultaneously. Now, if you neglect, if you do this expansion and you plug it into these equations, then you get that to leading order, this background metric has to just satisfy the vacuum Einstein equations without a source, and that's just the curve metric, so yay. And in the absence of, 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 of a small object, then that source, that curve metric is stationary, is not moving anywhere. Um, so to f essentially first half order higher than that, I'm going to have a point particle, which is how I'm going to describe this small compact object, moving, uh, or a test particle, moving in the background of the curve metric, which then gives me what Peter was saying, uh, the geodesic equation for the point particle. But then what I need to know is, okay, now that I have that point particle, the test particle moving in a geodesic, how is that, does it back react on the metric to generate the gravitational waves? So I have to go back to here, and now I have to put on the left-hand side that the metric is the metric of a black hole plus a perturbation, H, and I have to put in on the right-hand side that now I have a stress energy tensor, and that stress energy tensor is that of a test particle, and that test particle is moving with a trajectory or world line given by the solution to the geodesic equations. And so if you do that, you find, um, so equation one, one becomes box on H mu nu, uh, trace reversed in this case, equals a minus 16 pi T mu nu. After we use a particular gauge condition, which again Piotr was calling the, the wave condition, uh, well, wave coordinates, turns out that uh, that particular coordinate system, the wave coordinates that satisfy box x equals zero, imply um, when you do a perturbation about Minkowski, the gauge condition that d mu on h mu nu equal to zero with a particular definition of H. I can get into this later if you want. I'll probably have to describe it when I talk about post-Newtonian tomorrow, okay? 
So in their approximation, what they said is in order to solve this equation, uh, to make things even easier, we're gonna say that this box operator, which is supposed to be g mu nu covariant mu covariant nu, we're gonna replace for g mu nu and for the covariant derivative uh, the, back, the, the Minkowski metric. So we're gonna make the approximation that just when I solve this equation, just when I solve that equation, that the background is Minkowski, okay? And if I do that, then, oh, and I'm also going to say that t mu nu is that of a point particle or a test particle, so it has some mass for the small object, and then the four velocity, u mu, u nu, and then a direct delta function for dimensional of the coordinates, x rho minus zero of tau, theta. Okay. So if you do that, yes. There are so, so many questions. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so that's what I was trying to say. I went through it a little bit fast. So if you actually do this calculation properly, you'll realize that this is not the only term you have. If you do a perturbation about the curve metric, you also have a term that depends on the Riemann tensor, and this will be the box of the curve metric. So the approximation that Sasaki and Ruffini did, again, this is the kludgiest of the kludgiest models, okay? Is just say, well, when I have the linearized equation, I'm going to replace what was the supermassive black hole background with a flat Minkowski background, which is totally wrong. But we're gonna do it anyways, okay? So if you do that, then the Riemann tensor is zero. And then this is the box of Minkowski. And that's good because I think, if this is the box of Minkowski, I can invert this because there's a well-known Green's function for it. So the matter field is that of a test particle that has a mass m, and it's in motion with some four velocity like so, uh, that is localized uh, as a distribution. A what? Flash of matter. Yeah. Hmm, sure, let's give it that name. <laughs> it's a test. We call it a test particle in physics. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, so I didn't quite say that uh, explicitly. This is the trace reverse metric perturbation. So it's h mu nu minus one half eta mu nu times the trace of h calculated with the Minkowski metric. Yeah, so that trace reverse is computed from the eta trace, yeah. Okay, so then if you do that, Turns out you can solve that. You can, you know, the solution to that equation is very easy. Uh, you know, g mu nu, h mu nu is gonna be minus 16 pi box to the minus one of this. And then I'm done, right? Supposed to be a joke, but nobody got it. Okay, fine. <laughs> so you use your green function and you turn out, you end up getting, and it looks like minus four m times the distance to, to your field point where you're calculating this, times u mu, u nu, divided by a vector L alpha, u alpha, and all of this evaluated at retarded time. So retarded time is t minus, uh, t minus r, if you want, the field point r. Whatever. Leave it like this, t retarded. And L alpha here, is uh, the vector one times the uh, n unit vector that points uh, from, the field, from the field point to the, to the location of the small compact object, or vice versa actually. Small compact object to the field point. And u mu here is a four velocity, uh, which you write as gamma, some Lorentz factor, times one comma three velocity. And presumably you have this because 
you've used your geodesic equation to solve for the velocity of the test particle. So what is this solution? What do we call that solution in physics? No? No one? Huh? Yeah, it's the linear feature uh, solution for radiation. So it's linear Picard. I don't know how you pronounce these things. Solution of electrodynamics for a particle that's uh, it's moving on a flat background. Good question. So, so, in practice, we tend to write these things in um, coordinates that are adapted to the Minkowski background. Okay, so because this is the box of Minkowski, so we typically use, for numerical reasons, just Cartesian x, y, z coordinates. If you can use spherical coordinates if you want, but then numerically you get into issues sometimes when you hit the poles because you don't know how to evolve. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. But yes, they have to be adapted to the background. Okay. All right. Good. Nobody liked the solution, but it's a solution from the 80s. So, you know, now we're going to accelerate 10 years. I'm going to show you a less kludgy waveform called the clutch waveform, <laughs> or kludge, depending on how you pronounce it. I pronounce it clutch. So this is an idea. So the, the, the idea here is like, let's try to come up with some sort of approximation that solves these equations, but a bit more accurately, right? Like you don't want to be using, you don't want to be using this, 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 uh, this cheat, this incorrect uh, step of throwing away the background completely. It's going to be totally off. Um, so, so how do we do it? We do it as follows. We go ahead and we again follow what Peter was saying earlier. So to, at zeroth order in Q, leading order in Q, when Q is zero, then I should have a test particle moving in a geodesic. Now, that geodesic is going to have some, so to leading order, I'm going to have a geodesic. It's characterized by some energy, angular momentum, and Carter constant. Okay? Okay, so let me draw a two-dimensional space. This is a three-dimensional space, right, E, L, and, and Q. Let me just draw it in two dimensions. Let me suppress Q for now, so E and L. Um, so I can pick a point here, some initial condition for my geodesic. I just pick an orbit with some energy and some angular momentum, and that's just a geodesic. If I run a computer, it just, it'll just go around forever and ever and ever. If I pick E and L very, very intelligently, I can even make that orbit be a circle, right? So, but I, can, I could have picked another point. This would be another geodesic, and another geodesic, and another geodesic, and another geodesic. These are all different geodesics, okay? So here we go. Look at my beautiful grid of geodesics. So I've gridded this phase space. Okay, so what happens in reality is that if I start with some geodesic, I start my evolution here, somehow that geodesic needs to evolve and spiral into the black hole. Why is it spiraling into the black hole? Because the geodesic is disturbing the space time and that generates gravitational waves. So gravitational waves carry energy and momentum and current constant out of the system, which then back reacts on your orbit 
forcing it to spiral in, forcing the E, the L, and the Q to change in response to the emission of gravitational waves. So there has to somehow be, if I'm here, some way to compute how, how E and L will change due to the emission of gravitational waves in a small neighborhood of that phase space point. So if I can do that, I can compute like a little arrow, okay? And if this grid is very, very dense, this is not trying to scale, so let me just draw it like this. Oops. This is an arrow. I could then jump from here to here to this other point, and then there I can go and I can solve my geodesic equation again and calculate my rate of change of E and L and Q due to the emission of gravitational waves and calculate another arrow. So let's say this one takes me uh, this way. So I jump. So I jump to some point here. And I do it over and over again, computing little arrows that will take me, hopefully, through phase space from geodesic to geodesic to geodesic, okay? And then you join, the idea is that you join all of these geodesics together to get the full trajectory, okay? Ask me again in five minutes. Yes. So what we're doing here is something that it has been known in celestial mechanics for a very long, long time, it turns out. It's called um, osculating orbits. So the idea is that if I have an orbit that's a circle, and then I am losing energy and an angular moment. Well, let's just I'm losing energy such a way that after I lost uh, 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 an enough amount of energy, I turn into some sort of other circle. There's some limit that you can take in which this geodesic sort of osculates onto the next geodesic and then osculates onto the next geodesic and so on and so forth, sort of like shrinking slowly from one circle to the next circle to the next circle. So this was an idea that was put forth uh, for a variety of people, but um, the reference that I typically follow for this is Hughes, PRD, the 2000s. I think there's two papers where he explains this thing. So the main bit that's missing here is how do I calculate E dot, L dot, and Q dot? Right? How do I calculate, if I have a geodesic, how do I calculate how much, uh, how much the energy and momentum of the current constants change due to the emission of gravitational waves? So you need to prescribe somehow E dot, L dot, and Q dot. Okay? And there's a couple of ways in which you can do that. One way in which you can do this is by saying, I'm going to use the post-Newtonian expressions for E dot, L dot, and Q dot. So expressions that are only valid in the small velocity limit. Again, totally wrong because the geodesics are not necessarily slowly moving, but you can certainly do it and see what happens. So option, one option is you can do PN. A better option is you can use uh, something called black hole perturbation theory, which I'm gonna describe on Thursday to calculate um, something called Psi-4, which is one of the newman penrose scalars. And that Psi-4, you can eventually show, it can be used to calculate uh, the amount of uh, energy carried out by gravitational waves at spatial infinity. Okay, Psi-0 would allow you to compute the amount of energy absorbed by the black holes as the waves go into the horizon. So that's another way in which you can compute this, okay? So this is sometimes called the sort of frequency domain method for calculating, because uh, th there's a frequency domain method to calculating this psi four. Um, the post-Newtonian prescription of these variations of constants is much, much more kludgy. 
but definitely it's something that people have done in the past. Okay? So that's method two. And if you want, if you want something that's more complete, what you can do is remember that you have expressions for t dot, r dot, you know, theta dot, and phi dot, right? In one, from, for geodesics. That's how I started my entire lecture. And these things were functions of the coordinates, but there were also parameters, e and l and q here, which were supposed to be constant. And the same thing here, and the same thing here, and the same thing here. So what you could do is, if you have some sort of analytic way to prescribe e dot and l dot and q dot, say from post-Newtonian theory, then instead of just solving these equations numerically in a computer, you can solve these equations enhanced by these equations, which now means that your constants are no longer constant, but they're varying on a different time scale, but they're varying. So if you solve, if you do that, then that's another way of implementing this idea of oscillating orbits. Okay? Great. Okay. Okay, so in my last 15 minutes, let me tell you why all of this is completely wrong. And let me tell you what people have done to fix this problem. Or fix the problem with these approximations. Okay. So who can tell me what's wrong? Okay, who can tell me one thing that's wrong? No need to list everything. What have I not included when I do the calculation this way? The cell force, what is the cell force? Right, so the small object is Right. So the small object is not a test particle. And because it is not a test particle, it curves space-time. And because it curves space-time, the curvature that it produces on space-time actually back reacts onto its own trajectory. And that effect needs to be taken into account. Sometimes that effect is called the conservative part of the cell force because it's symmetric under time reversal, for example. It's if you want the part of, of the force that comes from the space-time metric or from the curvature in the space-time metric produced by the small object. And this thing that I'm calculating here, E dot and L dot and Q dot, they are essentially also producing a cell force, but it's a dissipative cell force, okay? It's telling you how, how your geodesic is not really a geodesic, but it's the, the trajectory is forced, if you want, by some sort of radiation reaction force. Okay, so this includes some part of the dissipative cell force, but we want to include the whole thing. So, cell force. And if you have questions, I think Bob is in the audience, and he can tell you how he derived these equations a long, 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 long time ago. <laughs> Better than I can. Um, all right, so, so this, is, this is my derivation of this thing. So, a, this is a, a non very much non-rigorous derivation <laughs> of this thing. What is it that you called it, Peter? Uh, it was a uh, very dirty <laughs> proof of how you do this result, right? Anyway, so, so what is the motion that you're trying to consider? The motion, you can write it down as the second derivative of the trajectory squared plus some gamma prime alpha mu nu dz mu d tau prime dz nu d tau prime equals zero. Where primes here denote the trajectory on the space-time g mu nu, which is equal to g mu nu of the supermassive black hole, plus a correction, h mu nu, due to the small compact object. So if you want, if you knew how the small compact object is curving space-time, 
you could in principle then take that metric, whatever that metric is, and plug it into here into the Christoffels um, and, and, and calculate and calculate the geodesic equation on that background. So this goes to what you were saying earlier. So you can think of this as the geodesic or geodesic motion in a perturbed background. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it, you can reinterpret this as, you know, geodesic motion, so no primes now, which is now not equal to zero, but is actually equal to some force, F alpha, that I'm gonna call the self force, and for good measure to make the unit work, let me multiply the whole thing by M, the mass of the small compact object. So you reinterpret this as a trajectory on a background that is just the background of the supermassive black hole, but that is forced. Okay, so this, these two descriptions, one of a, a trajectory on a perturbed background versus one of a trajectory in an unperturbed background that is forced can be made essentially equivalent. So what you do now, what you do now uh, is, we're here, is you, what we wanna do is we wanna calculate what this cell force is So, so, what is the cell force? What is F cell force? Okay, so we do some change of variables. You know, you know that d by d tau is gonna be equal to just d tau prime, d tau, d by d tau prime, and similarly for the second derivative. It's gonna be two terms in this case. Okay, and so we go back to this equation over here, which I'm gonna call equation two. And so equation two can be written as, um, let's say, M times D2 C alpha D tau squared d tau prime over d tau squared plus d two tau prime d tau squared d z alpha d tau prime plus the second term, which I'm not gonna touch, m alpha mu nu d z mu d tau d z nu d tau. Okay, so all I've done here is I have replaced in equation two uh, d by d tau squared by something that depends on d by d tau prime. Uh, this should have been a prime here, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so there's two terms here. So if I apply another d by d tau, there's gonna be one that acts on here, and it's gonna give me d2 tau, which is the last term, and another term is gonna, huh? I don't see what you're saying. So this, what I wrote is correct. This here? Um, no, no, so this is correct. So all I've done is I'm rewriting uh, this equation, so I'm not going to rewrite that in terms of tau, tau prime. So that's correct, okay? So I'm just doing it in steps, so just give me a second. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use that d2 z alpha d tau prime two is given here by equation three by this expression. So I can rewrite this uh, 
as minus m um, gamma prime alpha mu nu minus gamma alpha mu nu times d z mu d tau d z mu d tau plus the second term d two tau prime d tau squared want d tau d tau prime d z alpha d tau. Okay. So after you manipulate things a little bit, uh, you can see, like for example, this last term here, the second term, is appearing right here. This term over here comes from from there, and so this term over here is the second term in parentheses over there. Okay. And so now you notice two things. One thing is that this is the difference between two Christoffel symbols calculated in essentially two different space times. One is a space time that is not perturbed, and another one is a space time that is perturbed. So when I calculate that difference, the difference is just going to depend on covariant derivatives of the perturbation, because the covariant derivatives on the background are going to cancel. The other thing you notice is that this term over here, you know, it depends on on dz alpha d tau. But dz alpha d tau is a four velocity. And you know that the equation two, you know that equation two is saying that f s alpha, written in terms of the four velocities, u mu uh, d mu um, u alpha. And if I dot this whole thing with uh, u alpha, then this right-hand side is zero. Because u alpha, u alpha is normalized to minus one. So u alpha times f self force alpha is equal to zero, which means that the only part of the self force that we sort of care about for this derivation is the part that is uh, perpendicular to alpha, to u alpha, okay? So this piece here must be containing a part that's perpendicular to u alpha and a part that's parallel to u alpha. And the part that's parallel to u alpha at the end of the day must be canceling with this term. So in, since we only care about the part of u alpha that is perpendicular, uh, the part of f alpha that's perpendicular to u alpha, we can project, which is what we're gonna do now. And so the projection of F alpha cell force is just G alpha lambda plus U alpha U lambda. That's how we project perpendicular, perpendicular to U alpha. And you end up getting minus one half M G alpha lambda plus u alpha u lambda times times covariant derivative nu h lambda mu plus covariant derivative mu h lambda nu minus covariant derivative lambda h mu nu, where these covariant derivatives are associated with the supermassive black hole background, so the Kerr metric, okay? And this whole thing is sometimes called m times covariant derivative, this is defined to be m times covariant derivative alpha, beta, gamma, acting on h, beta, gamma. So that's the piece of the cell force, which is care about rock so now now you're almost done because um, well you are essentially done what you need to do to solve for the trajectory of the small compact object 
is to solve this equation over here. This is a geodesic that is being forced by this term over here. So this is to first order, so it's going to be the supermassive black hole uh, background. Remember, that's also the covariant derivative associated with the background. So you can calculate all of the terms here. But of course, this thing also depends on H. So you need to have some sort of prescription for what H is. So if you do properly uh, an expansion of the Einstein equation about a curved background, uh, SMBH plus H SCO, what you get is box of the trace reversed uh, metric perturbation plus two times the Riemann tensor, mu, alpha, nu, beta, acting on H bar mu nu, equal minus 16 pi some T alpha beta for your matter source. And again, here box is supposed to be box of the background, and R, the Riemann, is supposed to be the Riemann of the background. So now you have two equations that are coupled, one for the metric perturbation and one for the trajectories. This is not the equation for the trajectory. The equation for the trajectory is equation two with epsilon force this thing. And now we're done, right? Easy peasy, right? So Bob solved this in, do you remember when this was done? Seventies, eighties. Still in my thunder, Bob. <laughs> okay. The, yeah, yeah. But do you remember the year? This time. Okay. So what I was going to what I was going to ask the students was like, are we done? Like, is this is this it? And the answer, which Bob already gave you, is that no, this is not it, because that h mu nu is singular at the location of the point particle, or has a piece that's singular at the location of the point particle. So you need to figure out a way um, to resolve this this issue. Um, so problems. Uh, just write it over here. And this is, this will conclude my, my talk. It's running almost over. Um, so small, in quotation mark, problems. <laughs> so one, your test particle. has a divergent self-field at the location of the small compact object. Other little problem, delta functions, their distributions are not strong field representations of, uh, say, point particles, and so on and so forth. So the reason is that if you actually take a uh, ball of matter and you compress it more and more and more and more and more and more to turn into a test particle, then at some point the energy density that's contained inside of this body will become so, so large that that particle will collapse into a black hole by something called uh, the Hoop Conjecture, which you can read about if you want, by Thorne in the 70s. So the resolution, there's, well, there's different ways in which you can, you can show this result, but one way is to treat the small compact object as a black hole, treat the score as a black hole, and use my favorite mathematical technique, which is asymptotic matching.
So here what you're doing is you're solving for the problem in a neighborhood that's very, very close to the small compact object, and then in a neighborhood that's farther away from the compact object, and then there's an overlapping region of validity where you just match the two approximations. And if you do that calculation correctly, you discover that the cell force really is not M times D alpha beta gamma acting on H beta gamma, but rather it's M D alpha beta gamma acting on the regular part of H beta gamma, where H mu nu has been decomposed into a singular part plus a regular part, which by regular here we mean a part that doesn't diverge at the location of the test particle. So, um, this sort of expression with the regularization including is what Bob was referring to as the mi, sa, ta, ku, wa, <laughs> I guess, equation. Which stands for Mino, Sasaki, Tanaka, Queen, and World equation. Um, so I leave it there. There's a lot more work that uh, I had to gloss over for obvious reasons that goes into exactly how to extract this regular part of the metric perturbation. A lot of these calculations are done numerically, so subtracting a singular part is quite tricky. There's gauge issues, blah, 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 metric reconstruction. Um, so this is a very hot active area of research, and by the way, this is just your first order in Q, and we need everything done to second order, so good luck with that. Fortunately, I am not working on that, so I'll stop there. Thank you.